the infinite wrath of God and the infinite love of God, right? They're actually connected. Mm. And the thing is, even when we're in heaven for eternity, we are still not going to fully understand the infinite love of God. And if we are in in um, hell for eternity, we will still not understand the infinite wrath of God. Hey everyone, hopefully you're doing well. Welcome to the Jesus King Podcast. Today we're going to be speaking about, is God love? And there's a lot of scrutiny about it, because a lot of people question God's love concerning t- certain topics. So we're going to maybe start with Yvonne. Um, what, what do you, what's your idea, man? What's your thoughts? Yeah, I think the way we can think about this is uh, from the apologetics kind of side of Christianity, there's a lot of questions about you know if god love is if god's love why this and why is that now this is not an apologetics podcast but we can use those questions Mm -hmm. to understand the nature of what is god's love and i think the problem there in all of those questions is like there's a misunderstanding of what uh, love actually is so um and then maybe hopefully further down the track we can start talking about uh what God's love has done for us, how it's different. But in terms of apologetics, I mean, the biggest question that that comes up is, you know, if if God is love, why you, you know, if if you're telling someone that something's wrong and then they're like, why are you judging me? If God is love, you know, why don't you accept how I am? What, you know, um, maybe like someone who's doing a transgender or something like that and, and if a Christian is speaking against that, oh, shouldn't you just love me? God is love. Mm. So, um, yeah, if, if God is love, should we not um, have any, not judgment, but speak out against, right. um, you know, something that's wrong? Cool. Yeah. And um, I guess I'll be the first to answer that is uh, look at the father-son relationship or, or parents and children. Mm. Now, if if you, you you love your children, it's natural, it's inherent to love your children. Mm. <laughs> I do, I do, I do. Of course. <laughs> uh, would you just if if you love your children, why don't you just let them do whatever they want? Mm-hmm. Preach, preach, man. Why no? Why why the boundaries? You know? Yeah. Why, yeah. You know? why are you putting boundaries? True. Yeah. And. Uh, it's pretty clear, like, if your child is going down the wrong path, they're going mm. down to destruction, they're going to get hurt. Yeah. You know, there's, there is contention in love, mm-hmm. right? You look, you look at a, a marriage, right? A lot of the contention is because of love. If there was no contention, yeah, you think... You probably don't really care about that person. Yeah. 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 True. Yeah. Well, that can be a good question to ask, because sometimes once you put God in the question... Uh, people start to have all different ideas, Mm -hmm. right? But then when you take God out of the question and you just bring it down to earth and ask that question in a very natural way, you'll be like, oh, well, it makes sense now to me. For example, if I go to my wife and I say, how could you say you love me, but you don't allow me to cheat on you? You're like, wait, that's a stupid question, right? Mm -hmm. So if you bring it to God, you're like, hold on, how could you say God loves me, but I can't go do something else? Yeah. I have to be with God. Yeah. And you're like, well, now you start to understand the nature of the question. Well, yeah. that's that's a really good point because another one that people bring up is uh, love is love isn't jealous, according to right. you know, Corinthians. Love is love. <laughs> <laughs> love. Love is kind, you know, yeah. love is not jealous, yet yeah. God is jealous. Mm. So how how do we resolve that? Now let me let me paint this picture. Mm-hmm. Back when uh, you know we were all engaged and we were in love, and I mean more, we? we're more so we're in love now <laughs> yes. after ten fifteen we were. years. You, you so gotta watch your language. language. <laughs> <laughs> but you know a couple who are engaged yeah. and in love. Yeah. Now if let's say the girl or or the guy is you know going out on a date with someone else, you know, they're dressed up and they're getting in the car to go out and, and the other person's like, you know, yeah, see you, have fun. (laughs) Does that person love? Like, would you think if you saw that picture, something messed up, yeah. Yeah. Would you think that that person loves that 
yeah. person who's going. Yeah, true. I, I think that's a good point that you brought up because <clears throat> they say God is love and in his love there is jealousy. Mm -hmm. And because for us we've painted the word jealousy in a very bad light, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, it's not a good positive word. But the reality is when you read the Bible, God is jealous for the things that he already has. Mm -hmm. While for us, we're called to not be jealous for the things that we don't have, yeah. right? Like don't covet your neighbor's wife. Yeah. She never belonged to you in the first time. So you should not be, you should not have that jealousy towards your neighbor, but you should have that jealousy towards your own wife, mm -hmm. the one that's already yours. Yeah. So when God is a jealous God in his love, He's jealous for the things that already belong to him. Mm -hmm. And everything that God created belongs to him, right? Everything that's in my house, everything that I buy from my own money belongs to me. So if, if someone comes and be like, I would like to take that. I would like to share that with you. I'll be like, no, no hold on a sec. That belongs to me. Mm -hmm. That's mine. Yeah. So I'm jealous for the things I already have. But going back to the topic, because now we're getting into that holy jealousy, God is love, right? And in that question, maybe we can define what love is, yeah. because we know who God is, right? Yeah. If we define what love is, I think that can help us understand why God does a certain things. The way I like to think of it is where all this confusion happens is we look at it at just like shallow like we look at just the words. Now, God didn't just explain to us that he loves us. Mm. He didn't just explain. He didn't just use words. He showed it to us. And not only that, he showed it in a way that we understand. As humans, we understand what love is. It's natural. Mm. As a parent, as a spouse, you know, as a child for your parents. So we don't, we're not just told about what love is. Yeah. We, we live it. We, it's, it's part of our nature. So I think that is a really good in itself, uh, a definition. I don't need to explain why, um, you know, you can say you use the same word jealous, but they mean two different, yeah. two yeah. different well, we look at We look at the word jealousy in the New Testament when we see, you know, um, when we see what Paul is speaking about in love, but then we also look at that word jealous in the Old Testament in Exodus and in Deuteronomy as God being a jealous God. Um, those have two different connotations as well. But like what Martin was saying, it has to do with that which you already possess and own. Mm -hmm. But in saying that there are two outlooks of love, that there's a disparity between the biblical love and between what the modern person views as being love. Mm -hmm. Because the modern person is saying, if you love me, you will accept me for who I am and for my desires. But the biblical love is if I love you, I am willing to do anything for your betterment, for, for what will what will benefit you, mm. right? Yeah. And so we look at, what, at God's love for us and God puts boundaries, he puts specific things in place in, in our lives so that we can benefit, right? He demonstrates that through the cross, you know, while we were yet sinners, God demonstrates his love in that Christ dies for us. Yeah. Right? So it's a demonstration. It's an yeah. action. So, so would you say that the view of 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 8, uh, Paul says love, love is, is kind, love, love is patient, is patient, and so on. But then he says love does not burst. Love mm. does not do this. So what Paul is is speaking about he's telling you what love is and what love is not mm -hmm. so he's basically kind of bringing a shape and a boundary yeah. to what god's love is mm -hmm. so if we're going to that's try the and definition answer, that's yeah. the criteria of how we would view love so if we say oh god is love um so then he's just going to accept me for who i am yeah. well no, no no go back to the biblical definition and first corinthians 13 is is demonstrating the criteria of it's, that. It's yeah. speaking about that love does not celebrate yeah. evil. Yeah. So if something is evil and you say God needs to love me and mm. celebrate that yeah. in me, then you're like, wait, you're bringing your own definition yeah. Yeah. to what love is. If he truly loves you, he's looking to benefit you, to bring safety to you, to bring salvation to you. He wants eternal life for you. 
And this thing you are doing here is going to derail you from that. Yeah. And just like what you said, where love is giving and mm. it's not taking. Mm. And so just like in a, in a relationship with a husband and wife, uh, you don't love someone because you're taking the benefits of it. Uh, you love someone because you want to give them everything. And yeah. even in the Bible, um, you know, uh, we are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride. He, he uses that analogy because mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, um, it, it's kind of explained something in a way that we understand what love is. Yeah. yeah. Well, he uses natural expressions and illustrations. So God uses the illustration of a husband and a wife between him and Israel in the Old Testament and between Christ and the church in the New Testament so that we can understand what he's talking about. Mm. And that's why he uses those two analogies of father, son, and uh, husband and wife. And I think that's an important thing for us because we generally look at, you know, theology as being very distant from us. Like this is God's yeah. attributes, but it, there's a personal application in the Christian faith, where we're saying, no, that love of God transcends the eternal throne room, and it's here in our lives, right. day by day, right? We are we are an expression of the love of God, and and His love is being demonstrated day by day in the fact that we are waking up every single day to the mercies of God. Right? So you're saying the love that we feel, the mm -hmm. love that uh, is kind of, we can say natural, actually <clears throat> was given to us by God yeah, when he created of us. We talk about that as the common grace of God, that even the non-believer who will spit in the face of God, he still gives them some joys in this world and in this life, right? Yeah. And so he causes the sun to shine on both the righteous, the unrighteous, the rain to fall on the wicked and, and the just. Yeah. And so they are still at the grace and the mercy of God and being having his love demonstrated to them, even though, even though they are storing up for themselves wrath mm. in their defiance against him. So it's just, a, it's just a very interesting thing. And, and when we speak about the nature of God and the fact that he is love, it's very different to the nature of God in any other religion. Right. right. You know, because he loves his enemies. This is not something that is normal. It's not something that is natural to us. We look at our enemy and there's hatred. Right. There's anger, there's resentment. And he looks at his enemies and says, I love you. I want what's best for you. Yeah. yeah. Right. So God's love transcends the the way a human being yeah. would think of love. It what has, love is. It has to transcend because otherwise it is a finite love, not an infinite one. It's unconditional. It's unconditional. Well. And yeah. so we're gonna we are recipients of that in eternity. Right? And it begins now in our, in our life with God. But we are recipients of the love of God. And so if we say God is love, it has to pre-exist us. And it has to, it has to go on beyond us as well. Right? So it's not just, you know, here we are and God's demonstrating his love. But if we no longer exist, then God no longer has love. He is love mm -hmm. eternally. Cool. Uh, I know there's a few questions, but a question came up to my mind is... Uh, if that's who God is, how he should how should his followers be? And I know the easy answer is just like, oh, we gotta love like God. Yeah. But in a more pra practical, practical way. Yeah. Well, uh, this is a whole new topic, but I think, and I want to ask you guys as well: Has the love of God, as you become a Christian, made an impact on you? Changed you? Is it different? You think? from your experience, that if you were from a different religion, mm. if you didn't see the things like, you know, you know, we say love your enemy, but uh, the things that built, you know, when Christianity built up a lot of society, built up a lot of the world after after Christ. And, mm. and for example, um, free healthcare, that was a concept that was just not thought of. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it... It was Christians who would go out, and I think even during it was during the time of, of after Jesus, uh, the Roman time. But even during the plague, Christians yeah. would go in; they wouldn't care if they got the plague. Mm. They would really just give, you know, for the for the sake of helping someone, for the sake of showing love to someone, subject their body to death. During the Enlightenment Reformation period, preachers did that. Even Charles Spurgeon during the whole cholera outbreak, he's like, I'm going to go preach. I'm going to go help. I'm going to go do what I need to do. If I get it, I get it. 
God's sovereign, but these people need our help, right? So he's demonstrating a love in that he's sacrificing his own comfort, he's sacrificing his own life, because mm -hmm. he could die from this, mm -hmm. by helping those who are in need. I think that's something that is unique to Christianity, to Christ. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that. Yeah, uh, well, in... and it is the thing, even those in our, in Western society, in our society now, who they reject Christ, they reject Christianity, yet they are benefiting from that. That's right. And they still they still hold to certain views of that love that mm. they don't realize is actually a Christian view. The unfortunate thing is that it's starting to deteriorate yeah. as people are becoming more atheistic. They don't, they don't realize the benefits. Yeah. Uh, even um, Jordan Peterson, mm. you know, he, uh, I think before he was like, um, on his journey into yeah, yeah, on his journey to, but even before that, uh, from a like a psychological point of view, he's saying, you know, you got you guys have got to stop saying that there's nothing, there's no God, because you you don't realize the how much yeah. of society is built on the the fact, or he's not yeah. saying the fact, but I mean we know that yeah. it's true, but but I mean even as a bystander. He's saying, look at how much society has built up from that, how mm. much it takes from Christianity, from love, from loving your enemies. If you didn't love your enemies, everyone would just, yeah, it would just be violent. And that was the barbaric. world, that was the world pre-Christianity. Yeah. And we don't realize the dramatic transformation in history at the point of Christ, who's teaching these things that nobody had ever heard of. Mm. I mean, it was revealed in part in the Old Testament, but revealed fully in Christ. Mm that your love for your enemy needs to outweigh all other things, right? And Or your love for those who are around you as well. These, this is how you are to live because your Father in heaven exists in this way, right? And so if you want to be sons of your Father, you need to also do the things the Father and love the way your Father loves. So knowing the love of God and demonstrating that love to others kind of restored the dignity of man on mm -hmm. earth. Um, Christianity has paved the way to abolish slavery, mm -hmm. to restore women to who God created them to be, yep. and to bring that man was created in the image of God. And that's a huge value that we can have and respect. Like today, for example, it's crazy how people don't know this. Uh, we have more slaves today than we've ever had yeah. in history. Yeah. We've got over 14 million slaves. But guess where they are? Not in They're Christian. not in, in Western yeah. countries, mm -hmm. in, in Christian developed countries. They are in Africa, South America, and in Asia, right? Are under Hinduism, Islam, and so on. But people don't notice this. They think we've abolished slavery. Mm -hmm. That was like hundreds of years ago. You're like, no, no, no. There's more today than we've ever had before. Yeah. But the reason why you have that perspective is because you're so um, wrapped up yeah. in a Christian culture that you think that doesn't exist anywhere else yeah, so in the, the world. The problem now is people don't realize it's a Christian culture. 400 years ago, 800 years ago, they knew. Yeah. yeah they knew. This is, this is yeah. the Christian mm -hmm. culture. This because they, they, were, but, they were outspoken yeah. on the Christian faith. That, you know, we are a country built on this. Yeah. Right. And and the thing is, like, I mean, now you have all the blessings of Christianity. Yeah. Because we did a video about blessings in Christ. You have all the blessings of Christianity. You've just taken the label. That's it. Mm -hmm. You've put technology, science, new culture, whatever the movement is currently, right? Uh, but back to our topic. Um, since God is so loving, right? He's, as you said, he brings his rain. He shines his sun to birth, what happens after you die? Where where does God's love go there? Why is there such a thing as hell? If God loves, why hell exists? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'll get to that question. Cool. But before I, before I go to that question, is the stuff that we were talking about now, and um, you know that we have to help people who are suffering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the question is, if God is love. Why is there suffering? That's a lot of question that, that comes up. Yeah, a that's, lot. that's the the apologetics question of theodicy, yeah. and it's one of the <clears throat> when atheism was having its formation, that was the big question. Yes, that's right. And you've had thousands of years of commentators and Christians who were like, "Well, it's actually very simple, you know, suffering exists, and God is still good." 
how does that how do you reconcile okay. that? Yeah. yeah so uh i really want to jump into go for it sure do go it. for it man. so i want to ask you guys something what happens if you're a good christian mm-hmm. follow christ you have salvation and you die what are you going to get eternal life it's, are you, yeah. you going to get if that you're thing in are you going to get that thing where you know, if God is love, there is no suffering, mm. there is no pain, prosperity, there is no death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. In yeah, yeah. when we go to heaven, is there suffering? No, no. no. There's no suffering. There's, and the people are saying, if God is love, why is there suffering? Well, this is a very short period of time. Yeah, and and there is no suffering. And this God. was not how it was supposed to be. But in a way. We also have another thing. So this suffering is kind of more than what we bargained for. If if we didn't have suffering, if we were just in heaven, would we know what love is? Like, would we even ask that question? Would we ask, if God is love, why is there suffering? Mm-hmm. We, we wouldn't really, like, we just have love. We just have no suffering, no death, no, all the things that people say, if God is love, why is there suffering, right? But because of free will, that's when things started to go bad. So Adam Adam and Eve, they lived in that world that all these people are saying, well, if God is love, why is... They lived in that world. Yeah. Mm. But they did something under what? Free will. Yeah. And because of free will, we understand... And God is so loving, it's only a short period of time that we're going to go through. And we're all going to suffer. Mm. No one gets out of this life, Without you know, it's got free. That's 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 part of the life. Yeah. And I think this is just my opinion, but it's better to come out knowing what it's like on the other side, knowing what that suffering life is. Yeah. Uh, and and also looking at in light of eternity. You're saying that because it's now, but now it's going to end. Yeah. Paul speaks about it, you know, this light and temporary affliction. Mm is nothing in comparison to the glory that awaits, you know, the incomparable glory of God in heaven. No eye has seen, no ear has seen. You can't fathom and understand the joy that will be there. But, you know, our temporary time on earth, we're going to look at this incomparable glory. That was nothing in suffering compared to... Even if you look at it, even if you look at it as a time, on a time scale. Yeah. Uh, We live here for about 80 years. Mm. You're in heaven. Thousand years pass, two thousand, yeah. ten thousand years pass, a million years pass. Heaven is eternal. Yeah. So yeah. what was that hundred eighty, you know, eighty years on earth? Uh, but it was. So that I guess at least you can see and experience and know why. Otherwise, I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't have that full understanding yeah. of God's I, love. So, so what if someone comes and says, "Cool, you've explained to me heaven, mm-hmm. but you still got hell here." Yeah. You got to talk. So, about. so if... Let, let's just say someone might come and say, "Hey, I can give you a better scenario than what God has given you, right?" Universalism. The... Everyone just goes to heaven. Oh, not even everyone to goes to heaven because God has His own standards, mm-hmm. right? He doesn't want to just let people that don't want. He's not going to get people kicking and screaming to come inside, right? If they don't want to. So let's just say free will, so on. Those who have Jesus get eternal life. Those who don't have Jesus, why don't they just perish? Mm. Just, just no exist. don't exist. Well, why would you hold an eternal grudge on someone for year after year, a million years down the line? Mm. Like, let's just say a guy didn't want Jesus. He was into drugs, you know, alcohol, whatever. He lived his own life. Like, do you really want to still get that guy to suffer for a billion years? Mm. Well, like, yeah, I guess... The question is, if, if, if God is good, why does he put people in hell? Mm-hmm. And the answer is, in general, I think the people who ask that question, it's no not of what they speak. So what, in a way, it's I see it as there's misunderstanding, there's misinformation. It's like gossip, The you know, the, that... You know, when something happens and then there's Chinese whispers and, oh, you yeah. know, uh, the story changes. You know, ha- you who is who is asking if God is love, why does God send people to hell? Did you go to hell? Like, people are talking outside of what, you know, did God send you to hell and now you're complaining about it? 
Or did you hear something that someone said and you're putting these things yeah. together yeah. and and maybe, you know, there's assumptions and things. And I think a lot of that question comes from these assumptions. Oh, I watched a video and it said this person went to hell for doing this. But, you know, you're making a lot of assumptions there. Yeah. But what we know is God is just, right? And God is loving. Mm. So... I just yeah want to state that a lot of people ask these questions. They have not been there. Yeah, they're going off and making assumptions and not really understanding. Now uh, there are a lot of things on YouTube. I don't know if you want to believe these things, but uh, you know, there's people say that they they died momentarily and they saw hell and they came back. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you guys believe in that yeah. sort of thing, but if we look at what they say is they say that when they were in... Oh, I've seen a few of them. And they say, when I was there, like, I had no answer. Like, I knew I was why I was there. Mm. And I couldn't argue. I couldn't ask, why am I here? It's kind of... It, it becomes... Everything is open and clear. And so I believe people who go to hell choose hell. Mm. Right? So... They they know why. God is not going to say, "Oh, oops, you know, you you didn't you didn't know this, yeah, and, yeah. and therefore you accidentally oops, went to hell. yeah, you accidentally <laughs> went to hell." God is not going to God. We know that God is just. We know that God is loving so much that what the whole Bible is about God trying to not send the, get us to hell, mm -hmm. coming and dying on the cross. But what like why did God do that? Why did He send His Son? To show us how much he doesn't want us to go to hell. Mm. God doesn't want... So, it's a misunderstanding. People cool. who make it so easy, oh, why does God send people to hell? Well, you don't really know what you're talking, what you're talking about. about. Yeah. Cool, yeah. cool. Um, any words from you, A? Yeah, in, in regards to that, lack of understanding of the justice of God. The, he is not a wicked judge. And um, I like what... I believe it was Ray Comfort that, that said this. He's like, imagine you are a rapist, <clears throat> a murderer, serial rapist, serial murderer, serial thief. You have done every wickedness ever imaginable. And you come up to the judge and the judge lets you off scot-free. And so, yep, yeah, you're all good. You know, enter the joy and, you know, go be free. There's no justice in that. Mm. There's absolutely no justice. Um, that person in their wickedness was choosing evil. And was choosing to do not what to do what was not right, knowing what was not right, and there needs to be recompense for that. And either it's going to be recompense in that Christ took your punishment and you believe in him and that is taken away, the judgment is taken away, or you have to for eternity take on the punishment for those actions. And the standard of God is so high that He's so righteous and he's so just and he's so perfect that it will take an eternity of punishment to alleviate that wrath and that anger he has towards the sins. But like you said, we are choosing that. That's you right. are choosing it by rejecting the Son, by rejecting Christ, right? So we, we, we see that in John 3, that those who reject Christ, they remain in the wrath of God. That's right. the, the wrath of God remains on them. That's right. So the wrath of God is already on you because of your own sin, because of your own choices. And there is a way out of it in Christ and in his work. So there's the demonstration of God's love. Right. But you need to make that choice. Again. Yeah. So that's that's what I wanted to touch on. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've done all these horrible things. Yeah. And you choose if you choose not to do it, but the where God's love is, is you can actually choose to repent. Yeah. You can actually choose that God will forgive all horrible things that you've done if you choose, if you repent, yeah. if you turn to God with all your heart. To me, that's like, you know, that's like a good deal. That's a good deal. That's the get out of jail free card. That's the get out. <laughs> if you're free. And then if yeah. you don't even want to choose that. Yeah. Then you've yeah. made the choice. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that's a good example of, of showing like a natural... Yeah. Um, and that's very limited. That's very finite. It's a limited example in comparison to the actual standard of God against sin and, yeah. and, and his hatred of and how devastatingly evil sin actually is. I don't think we, we understand that. Yeah. Mm. 
It's, do you think we do you think we under, start to understand a little bit of it as we you know have the Holy Spirit? We do, but I I still believe God veils it for our benefit mm. because I don't think we could bear it. I don't think we can actually bear how devastating sin actually is. Mm. And so God will reveal to us the evil of our sin so that we can come to repentance and so that we can know his love and joy. But I still don't believe. It's like the infinite wrath of God and the infinite love of God, right? They're actually connected. Mm. And the thing is, even when we're in heaven for eternity, we are still not going to fully understand the infinite love of God. And if we are in in um, hell for eternity, we will still not understand the infinite wrath of God. So it's going to be an eternity of us exploring and understanding the love of God in heaven. It's going to be also an eternity of us exploring the wrath of God if we are in hell. Yeah. And we will never truly understand the fullness of it. Of both but, of us. but at the end of the day, <clears throat> it, it's your choice. Uh, yeah. On earth, yeah. it's your choice. Yeah. You, you, That's you clear. choose to go to hell. That's clear. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And obviously suffering in hell is not a payment, which is why it's eternity, mm -hmm. right? You're there, you're, you're guilty, off, yeah. you're not paying for your sins. Unlike Christ, when he was on the cross, he actually, he actually paid, paid for our sins. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why there's a difference when the wrath of God was on Christ. It wasn't, he wasn't on the cross for eternity. Mm -hmm. He was there for six hours. But for the sinner, because they're not paying for their sin... They're just eternally guilty, mm -hmm. eternally condemned. I think the biggest pain is not the physical, you know, horrors in hell, but just being far away yeah. from the from Creator. Yeah. yeah, it's the opposite of what what Christ said. That eternal life is to know God and to know Christ, and eternal death is to not know. So that word "know" is to be in fellowship mm -hmm. with. So. Hell is literally that separation from God that you are not you are not going to have the blessing of fellowship with God for eternity. That that connects with that question we were talking about. If God was here, why is there suffering? Uh, it, sorry, if God is love, why is there suffering? Yeah. And there's the reason why there is suffering in hell is because God's love is not there. Yeah. So yes, yeah, suffering will exist. Cool. A anything you guys want to share um, as a final yeah, thing? So, um. I know we talked about all these like apologetics questions and then I think though we need to understand that maybe some people have gone through experiences and they're angry uh, and as Christians we should always have compassion for yeah. that even like you were saying you know if someone you know spits spits at you know God or something like that uh, God is always compassionate and I think we should always be compassionate if someone is asking us a question and they're angry and they're saying, oh, I've got his love, you know, this and that. And we just need to know that we're in a broken world. People have gone through a lot of pain. Mm. They probably don't understand what, why they're going through this pain. It's our God. It's our job to, to just tell them um, the truth, tell yeah. them the good news that Christ loves them. There's a plan for them um, and pray for them. Mm. One, one final thought for me is don't, reject the love of God and God's love because someone who bears his name as a Christian does not fully manifest it. Mm. You know, there are we Christians, we're broken as well. You know, we 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 live in a broken world and we make the wrong choices. And there are times where manifesting and, and bearing the name of Christ as a Christian, we are demonstrating the love of God to others. And sometimes we demonstrate it in a flawed way. And there are times where people are like, well, I reject your God because of how you have treated me and how you have related right, his love. Yeah, and my encouragement to you, look, I'm going to make mistakes as a minister of the gospel and so will you guys, but don't reject the love of God. Go to the scriptures themselves. Go to God himself and he will demonstrate his love, his infinite love for you. And he has. 2,000 years ago, he did that. He demonstrated his love for you in that while you were yet a sinner guilty in his by his standard, he died for you. He loves you. And so go to God to know and experience that eternal love and that infinite love. Right? And don't take it from just mere men. We're trying to direct you to that infinite yeah, love and that, that great love. Great. 
Uh, well, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Obviously, there's much more to talk about in this topic, but uh, we've only got a short time and we might do maybe a part two on, yeah. on this topic. It's a good topic. It's yeah. an important one. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. God bless you and take care. See ya.